Our Father and our God, again we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for this privilege and this opportunity to fellowship together in the study of your word. As we approach your word today, give us a heart to understand, a desire to know more and more of the revelation of our God, of his grace, of his love, and of his concern for us. And as we study your word together, may we also more and more yield ourselves under the mighty hand of our God in order that our attention might be centered on things above, not on things on the earth. I ask you would filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts, only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at Blessed Hope Forever. Uh, hope you all are having a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. We've been studying together the uh, stewardship or the responsibility that's been given to us as, as uh, believers in Christ in this ministry of reconciliation, a declaration of that which God has accomplished in Christ Jesus, a marvelous message of grace. We are not reconciled to God because we ask to be, uh, nor because we deserve it, but because of God's grace and God's love. We've seen in our study of the Word that we are His children, that He planted us, uh, that He committed to us the grand opportunity and the privilege to declare this uh, exercise of His grace. There seems to be no place in the context at all for us to sit back and say, well, if He did it, why do we need to declare it? And I suppose we, we could have very interesting discussions involving uh, a lot of human reasoning and, and many hours of talk and still not be able to fathom the heart of our God. The revelation is clear that we belong to Him, that He not only bought us, but that He sowed us. We have the declaration in Matthew 15, Every plant which my Father hath not planted shall be rooted up, and that our beginnings with God were long before we ever had any realization that it existed. Since that be true, then why should we have any eagerness at all in carrying the ministry of reconciliation? Well, because we love Him. I am ecstatic that I found out that I was a child of the King. I recognize that it would not have changed the essential truth had I never known it, but it surely does change my attitude. You know, the joy, the opportunity, and, and the process of my walk to know that I belong to Him, that I am His, that He redeemed me, uh, if nothing else. There comes a, a great peace and rest in Christ. Now, it seems that God has privileged us to carry that message without any argument. He didn't need us. And I think that we ought to recognize it more as a privilege uh, than a necessity or an obligation from the standpoint of God. Since we were urged not to take this in vain, not this grace, not take it lightly or casually, it should have a profound emphasis on our attitude toward the Word of God and His people and in our fellowship and in our fellowship with other believers. Beginning at the 11th verse, 
in the sixth chapter, we have the first command in 2 Corinthians, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I believe there's an interesting study there between the, the command of Romans 6.11, the first command given in Romans, and the first command of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We were told in the 14th verse of chapter 6, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Verse 2 of chapter 7, yoke yourselves together with us. I've often suggested uh, to you folks uh, for your own study that we are not primarily looking at Paul's attitude, uh, Paul's functioning, Paul's heart, Paul's work, Paul's approach to responsibility, or anything else. I believe that we are primarily studying together a revelation of God the Holy Spirit, and that first of all, we should see the exhortation of verse 2, receive us as an exhortation from the Holy Spirit. Rather than yoke yourselves, rather than yoke ourselves together in the ministry of reconciliation with unbelievers, why not yoke ourselves under the control of the Holy Spirit? To me, there is primarily an emphasis here on being controlled by the Holy Spirit in the work of the ministry. Of course, without any argument, there is an indication here of yoking ourselves together with those who are believers in the ministry of reconciliation. There's no question about that. But if we lose sight of the fact that we're getting a glimpse into the heart of God we lose a lot of the grandeur of the passage, in my opinion. In Ephesians, we're told, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess. That's an unequal yoke. You who belong to God are being controlled by wine. It controls how you think. It controls how you walk. It controls how you talk. And that is the very attitude of Ephesians, speaking together in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. Now, I am not giving you folks any uh, a total abstinence message here, okay? That's between you and the Lord. The passage says, don't be controlled by the wine. That's an unequal yoke but rather be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Don't be controlled by the wine. That's the unequal yoke. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Here, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but be yoked together under the control of the Holy Spirit. That is the grand message of the passage. The application of the passage is be yoked together with those who are believers. Receive us. Well, how does the Holy Spirit work together in this yoke? We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. This particular verse, the second verse of 2 Corinthians 7, was the text of a sermon that I heard on the radio many years ago. The pastor went on at great length on how so many ministers depart from the truth of that verse. They defraud their congregation, they wrong it, they corrupt it. And he had it all about money. That's where he centered his message. 
Now, I am not saying that the dominant meaning here is one of money or of physical practice, or it's not. I, I am not saying that that has no application in the verse. I'm certain it does. But if that's the only application, if that deals only with money and legal contracts and business relationships, it wouldn't matter whether I was redeemed or, or not. It wouldn't matter whether I was redeemed or unredeemed. I could claim the truth of that verse. There must be more in the verse. If it is, in fact, the heart of the Holy Spirit, then it seems to me that the passage suddenly changes its light. Totally. What Christian would consider that God had ever wronged him? Well, most of them that I meet that are in trouble. Oh, they, they might not always come right out and, and, and say those words, but it's how a lot of Christians think. I am telling you that I believe with all of my heart that God is not wronging us. I have wronged no man. First and foremost, the word wrong is a good translation. It's a broad word. It could mean that I, I cheated on my income tax or, or I cheated someone out of money. It could mean uh, a lot of things. It could mean that I misdirected you in some deal or in some way. It could mean that I, I smeared your reputation. It could mean a lot of things. But if I suddenly say that this is the Holy Spirit, it's saying to me, Steve, in the midst of all that trouble and all of that difficulty, I have not let you down. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And surely the heart of God is centered not just in your physical good, but primarily in your spiritual welfare. I'm not suggesting that physical things don't work together for good, but I'm not, I'm really not all that certain that they work together for what we might define as physical good. God can do anything that He wants with me, folks. He's my God, He bought me with a price. Almost daily, I pray, Lord, I don't really care what happens. Don't take my trust away. Don't let something happen in my mind or in my life somehow that I cease to trust you and rest in you. I think the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm the one who is your friend. I've never let you down. That's what God said to Israel in the Old Testament. I bore you on eagle's wings. I bore you on eagle's wings. And I brought you to myself. I don't know what you do when you study the Bible. I sit and read verses like that, and I'm astounded. I mean, had I been Caleb, I wouldn't have called it eagle's wings. You know, I would have called it... Uh, gnats and bugs and flies and sand fleas and snakes and hot and sun and, and you know, and the air conditioner didn't work. Well, it, 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 they did have a cloud by day at least, but, but boy, it didn't, it didn't look like eagle's wings to me. I mean, that's the slowest eagle in history, 40 years to get to where that, that you can get in 10 minutes today by jet. God says, I bore you on eagle's wings, and I have to think God's language and mine can be dramatically different if I don't use eyes of faith. Surely one lesson that I'm to learn from God's dealings with Israel is that there is a dramatic, a stark contrast between that which I see and experience 
and that which is, in fact, spiritually true. And I look at Corinth with the corruption, the filth, uh, the sin in that city. And not only in that, only that city, but, but obviously in the fellowship. And it seems to me that the heart of God is saying, I, I didn't wrong any man. I'm going to take that from the standpoint that God hasn't led you down a wrong path. Now, I recognize that the context is talking about Paul's dealings in Corinth. I understand that. And I believe that there's a lesson there for us as Christians. But first of all, I have to look at what the Holy Spirit is saying that the personal activity of the child of God under the direction of the Holy Spirit has not been to cause him harm. Now, it may not look that way physically, but the truth is that it's been for his spiritual good. Secondly, we, we have corrupted no man. There, I believe the word means to spoil, and so my mind and my heart are, are drawn to doctrine. It's not the Holy Spirit who's lied to us in, in, with any false doctrine, uh, to any corruption of the Word of God. It's an, it's an easy thing to say that Christians can't do that, but folks, Israel's doctrine was horribly corrupted in the Old Testament. God called them His people, he bore them on eagles' wings. It was not God who corrupted their doctrine. You know, we could argue, you know, why God would allow it to happen. I, I don't know the answer to that. I can suggest to you that I believe, above all things, we're going to shout in glory that deliverance belongs to our God. Yet I believe what, what almost every Christian wants to think he's going to shout in glory, is that deliverance was the product of his faithfulness. And it seems to me that God has put us in a situation of losing at every turn so that we rebound and we rejoice in the truth that it's God. It's, it's, not, my, it's not my strength. It's not my might. It's not even my trust, but it's God's faithfulness. We have defrauded no man. I'm going to take the, the first one as an inward experience, uh, the second one as uh, doctrinal, and the third one, I believe, is outward. Now, we can take the verse simply at face value and say, well, you know, Paul the Apostle with Timothy and Titus, you know, they went to Corinth and in no way did they cheat anybody. They didn't cheat any man financially uh, in practice, in reputation, in word. And, and folks, I think that's true. And I believe the verse says that. But I believe the verse says infinitely more than that that when I am yoked with the Holy Spirit through the physical situation that he, those he, he takes me through, it may look devastating to me from a human standpoint, but God is not in any way wronging me. He's not in any way corrupting me or defrauding me. Not one single bit. We started out, if you remember, in 1 Corinthians, uh, in chapter 1, but God is faithful. I don't speak this to condemn you. Now, the this and the you are italicized if you have the authorized version. I am not speaking to condemnation, for I have said before, that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. 
Now that is a tremendously complex problem in Greek translation. This is one of uh, those verses where that, you know you see great differences between uh, one version and another. And then you come to a YouTube channel here like, uh, like this and you get me, you know, who may not know what I'm talking about. It's a rough verse. It's an aorist. It's a present. It's a ace or ice uh, with the infinity. In fact, with two infinities. And uh, one wrestles uh, with this, particularly when one comes up with a translation that's not like some of the expert translations. So I want to I want to wave a big red flag here, and uh, you know I'm tempted to skip over the verse, but I can't do that. So personally, I believe that the verse says, "I speak not to condemnation." I have said before that we die, aorist, active, infinitive, together and live present active infinitive together. I don't believe the verse is saying that Paul is willing to die at uh, burning it, being burned at the stake or, be, or being drowned or thrown to the lions and, and, just, and that he hopes that the Corinthian believers will, will follow suit, okay? I believe the verse is saying supremely more than that that we died with Christ once. There's your aorist. Uh, and, uh, and, and continually, present tense, continually live with Him. There's, that's the present tense. Romans chapter 6, we died together. Uh, to me, it is a marvelous revelation of Scripture that when Christ died, I died. Uh, when He was buried, I was buried with Him, raised with Him. When He, when he rose, I rose with Him. Uh, there's a verse in John which says, uh, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And I'm sure thousands of sermons have, have been preached on that verse concerning the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, lifted up on a cross, uh, you know, being defined as His death on the cross. I believe a simple glance at the Greek prepositions there clearly indicate that the lifted up is his resurrection from the dead. And that destroys an awful lot of heartbreaking sermons. And I'm not suggesting that the sermons aren't true or um, at least they, they didn't contain some truth, but the text doesn't support that sermon. It speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Romans, uh, if you remember back when we were studying in Romans, we were told that not only did he die on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, but we died with him. We were buried with him uh, through baptism into death, and we rose with him. In fact, when uh, we went through Romans verse by verse, yeah, as well as other, other epistles, uh, uh, we were confronted... Uh, several times with the fact that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we rose from the dead with Him. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't occur when you accepted Him, when you accepted Christ, or going down some aisle, shaking some preacher's hand. It wasn't when you came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. It's not when you rose from the dead with Him, but when He rose. In God's economy, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you rose from the dead. That's every believer, every single last one of you, every one of God's children from Adam until whoever, until, you know, whoever's last rose from the dead. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, every one of God's children rose with Him without exception now, it seems to me that this verse is saying not so much that I'm willing to die if necessary uh, with you folks, uh, yoked with you, but rather the realization that I died with Christ and yoked under the control of the Holy Spirit, I'm living with Christ, walking with Christ. I'm alive 
living with Christ. Now, maybe I, I pushed it too far, uh, but I cannot reach the conclusion that all of that I'm reading there is a willingness on the part of a human named Paul to physically die with humans who are living at Corinth. Sorry, I get that is not the primary meaning, I don't believe, of that verse. I have an abundance of Scripture to support my uh, co-death, co-burial, and co-resurrection with Christ. I think if Christians could ever just you know, stop to realize, totally realize, just let it grip every fiber of their being, that the life that they are living, they are living with the risen Christ, it would absolutely change their, their life, change their attitude. If I could get it through my, my head every moment of every day and in every situation that, that my life now is a life yoked together with Christ and with one another uh, in this ministry of, of reconciliation, what a dramatic thing that is. Remember, folks, it is God who causes the growth. One, one plants, one waters, but God causes the growth. Now, I've already, I've already said that I believe that there is a physical application of this text, a physical yoke between you and other believers. I'm not trying to destroy that. I believe that's there. But, folks, I believe that there is a lot more there unless I depart from the conviction that the Holy Spirit is talking to me and I just drop back to, to it only being Paul talking to them. I think I have here a beautiful picture of our yoke together and our yoke with Christ. Obviously, uh, there's more than just a physical yoke in view at the close of chapter 6, and there must be more than a physical yoke in view here in, in chapter 7. Walking risen with the risen Christ, yoked together with the risen Christ, realizing that God in His almighty knowledge and wisdom, in His supreme sovereignty, and his love for me has neither wronged me, nor corrupted me, nor defrauded me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that not what he said? You know, not if, well, if God really loves me, he would do, he would do this, that, or the other thing. What, what a terrible thing to say. There is, there is no if about God's love for you, folks. And there are uh, those who say, well, you know, I don't care what the Word says. I know that God is faithful, but, you know, He's, he's punishing me because of my sin. And somehow or other, we're not willing to say what God says, that we're dead to sin. And we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you, we are not under law, we are under grace. And that rupture, folks, between law and grace is painful and it's rough. I believe that we have a glimpse of that when we get down to the fifth verse, we're troubled on every side. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. So what Paul had in Macedonia were, were all these uh, radical hippie delinquents trying to knife him and shoot him and uh, shoot him in the back and, and poison him. And, no, no. I don't think that you can, you can put that in the, in the verse. I think that the trouble, fighting, fears were part and parcel of those in Macedonia who felt a tremendous urgency and a tremendous drive to put Paul and his companions, and you and me, under law. Dearly beloved, a Christian's walk in law keeping devastates the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, of which you were a part. 
Galatians chapter 3 says, If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, His faithfulness, might be given to them that believe might be by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And, 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 then they're, and they're here. now we have a horrible fight. You know, the greatest battle in all of Christendom is between grace and law, not between whether, you know, you uh, paint your toenails or not, or smoke or not, or, or, or succeed at whatever it is that you're trying to succeed at. It's between grace and law. It is a tremendous theological battle, and you are part of it. I believe that the wronging, the corruption, and the defrauding is first of all primarily spiritual and secondly physical. Secondly, I believe uh, the emphasis uh, is primarily a yield on, is on a yieldness, uh, uh, the yoke of God, so that I recognize this direction in my life and I recognize that He is functioning for my good because of His love for me, because I'm His child, where I don't question Him. I'm living a life with the risen Christ. The Corinthians were not wronged by the presentation of the gospel. They're not being lied to. They're not being led into a situation where that, that they believe that their God uh, can be manipulated by some other earthly temple or pagan gods or deities that, that rule the day, or the rule the society there in Corinth. Verse 4, great is my boldness. Your authorized version says of speech. It, it seems to me that the word of speech is, is not there. It's not there in the original text. It, it's inferred, but it's not there. Great is my boldness towards you. Great is my glory or my boasting. I am filled, that's a perfect tense in the Greek. I have been filled with, with the comfort, the comfort. I am absolutely overflowing with the joy in all our tribulation. Here's the Almighty God saying, I'm the faithful partner in this. And what I want you to recognize is that you are not alone. You are not being wronged. You're not being corrupted. You're not being defrauded in bearing my yoke. Thank you all for joining us uh, again, once again. Uh, I hope you find these studies helpful. I love you all, I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.